Well, tonight we're in Hosea 10, which is basically a continuation of chapters 8 and 9 in spirit, uh, which, as you recall, were just a series of long rebukes against Israel. And you remember, of course, this whole book really has been a set of admonishments through the eyes and mouth of the northern prophet Hosea on behalf of the Lord, who has just grown absolutely weary. He's tired of centuries and centuries of Israel just going their own way, being on a perpetual, unrepentant, disobedient streak. And so chapters 1 through 3, the Lord typifies Israel as a spiritual prostitute. Again, that's as impolite language as it was back then as it is today. Uh, It's shocking to hear somebody say that about somebody else, to call them something like that. But that is spiritually where Israel was. They were promiscuous in their dealings. And he actually, the Lord used symbolically Hosea's own life, particularly his marriage to Gomer, as an object lesson of that infidelity. You remember that Gomer was uh, a woman that kept leaving, forsaking Hosea and going to other lovers, and that Hosea would have to redeem her out of that. And even the three children, only one of whom we know for sure was uh, Hosea's child, um, they represent coming judgments. Their names represent uh, uh, future incriminations that Israel will be facing. And so in those first three chapters, we get a lot of Hosea's own life, his own biography as a symbolic depiction of how bad Israel is. But in these last six chapters and tonight, God has set aside, set aside that visual lesson and just used preaching to bombard these people with the truth. And so what we've been seeing in these last six chapters and tonight are kind of outlines and collections, the important ideas of Hosea's preaching ministry over the course of 25 or 30 years. So a lot of the images and metaphors are things that he would have used in actual probably longer sermons, and they've been collected together, uh, perhaps some, maybe by some of the faithful uh, students he might have had, maybe himself, we're not totally sure about that. But he is living in a time where Jeroboam II is in charge of northern Israel, and the Bible describes him just as the, one of the most wicked kings that Israel had ever seen. And uh, he has led Israel into uh, just a bleak state of affairs. Now, in some sense, they're prominent. They're doing well. Their economy is okay. Uh, their military is growing. So in some sense, they look like they're strong, but God's assessment of them is the opposite. Because Israel depends not on the Lord. They depend on all sorts of unjust economic practices, alliances with pagan nations, and uh, just they're growing into a military mindset. Uh, that that's where their true power comes from, their swords and spears and horsemen and chariots, not in the Lord. So every aspect of their public and their private life, every aspect has been tainted with sin. There's not one aspect of their culture that is, or or their religion, um, that is free from sin or is, is pure before God. They have evil, greedy, lecherous leaders, especially their priests who have led them in rituals to praise Baal more than they do their own God that established them in the land. And Baal, as it turns out, is is a nothing, is a nobody. Um, He's not there. We see that in other parts of Scripture. When the priests of Baal call on him, he doesn't respond. But when uh, Elijah calls on the Lord, he shows up. And so whether they were in years of plight and famine, we've seen some of that um, where they're, they've had tough years or they're celebrating their wealth like they did um, in chapters uh, um, nine, eight and nine, especially nine last week. You remember where Hosea, the image is that he bursts into one of their feasts and climbs on their tables and, and warns them about the coming war and famine and worst of all, exile. You know, just a great way. To have, uh, to have a party together. A, a crazy man comes in and starts screaming about how they're all going to be in chains in a few years. Um, any way you slice it, they were deep in sin. But in tonight's passage, uh, we only hear from God, uh, in first person at least, his speaking from his perspective once, and that's in verses 11 and 12. But mainly, Hosea's perspective is given here. And whereas before, you we've seen a lot of... Um, uh, uh, exact punishments about what Israel is going to face. Instead, Hosea just 
continues to offer accusations here. He doesn't really um, describe the punishments as much since he's not God and he, uh, he has no control over that. But what he continues to do is to, uh, to show Israel that, they, that they're just guilty as can be. Now, historically speaking, these speeches, these paragraphs and sermons that are kind of combined and collected here, um, especially in this chapter, probably were written around 733 BC. I know that number doesn't really mean anything to us in particular, but that's about 12 years um, before historians agree that the Assyrians just swept through northern Israel and wiped them out. So they've got three presidential terms until their utter destruction, to put it in, uh, to put it in perspective for us. Uh, so that's that's kind of a scary thing. Of course, they don't know that at this time, but that is how close they're getting to judgment. And so this is they're they're probably at this point wrapping up what's been known become known as the Syro Ephraimite War. Uh, historians call it that because it is the war between Syria to the north, not us Syria, but another nation called Syria and Ephraim, or Israel. And uh, that's where they start getting involved with the Assyrians. And so that's where they are politically speaking. That war is kind of tapering off. They're probably expecting some good days are ahead, but they've got exile, just not even, de- well, a little over a decade away. So um, that's what is uh, that's what we have in mind historically. So Hosea, in one last-ditched effort, probably himself not knowing when... Uh, the hammer was going to come down, is trying to snap Israel out of their idolatrous stupor. God has pronounced judgment on them. He's been there to deliver it. Now he's doing his own commentary saying like, wake up, just pay attention. And so in verses 8, 1 through 8, he goes on or he goes after the Israelites worship uh, at their detestable law violating altars. So he takes on their um, the, the religious rituals they have at their altars. And then in verses 9 through 15, the second half of the chapter, um, he attacks them more broadly for their social and public sins that have only brought warfare on the land and will bring another extreme war on their head in just a few short years, whether they believe him or not. So he's going to attack their religion and attack their uh, just their public life and how that's just bringing everything to an end. That's what really what this chapter addresses. But again, at the root of any of the sins that are being described here is their inability to love, trust, and obey the Lord. That's where it all comes back to. And so that's the thing that ultimately seals their doom. All the uh, all the bad things to do, the, the, the bales they worship, uh, the people that they violate and enslave and all those things, um, that are un- absolutely unnecessary to do. All of that is just an outcropping of their um, uh, their not loving the Lord. So, uh, and Hosea starts his uh, his admonition of them in uh, in verse one here, which we're going to look at now, verse one through eight. We're going to take that as a block. Now, do you remember last week the Lord? kind of gave an illustration for how he looked at Israel at one point, uh, and it was towards the end of chapter 9, he, where he says he once looked at Israel like they were wild, sweet grapes that might be discovered in a dry and lifeless desert. So if the image is God is a traveler through the wilderness, and, uh, and there's no water, and there's no shade, and it's hot, and there's wild animals all around, well, then he comes around a corner and look at that from a, a little vine outcropping in a, a, a dusty wall. There's some grapes, and they're filled with liquid, and they're sweet, and I mean, they're, they're life-giving. They're um, uh, precious. And so God, when he looks at Israel, he looked at them at some point. He spoke of them so lovingly, with full of delight. He really... This is, this is not a great way to say it, but he's like how we might say, oh, you're proud of something. He's proud of Israel. Not that he takes pride in them, but he's a sense of joy. You know, you know that what I'm trying to describe. Um, it was really clear that God loved Israel. He adored them. How he could sometimes, we don't know. But how he says he loves us, we don't get that either when we really know ourselves. But he does. He sincerely means it. He loved Israel. But this once sweet, life-giving fruit in the desert turns to 
something utterly poisonous in time. As, as Israel continues to distrust the Lord and disobey him, he eventually says in that same chapter that he begins to hate them for what they had become. Not He used to love them, but now he hates them. The full scope of that, I don't imagine we can really understand. But all their world-changing and God-proclaiming potential, all that what they could be, um, uh, a people that were the new people of God, a new Garden of Eden uh, that God planted in the middle of the, the world in, in this little you know, desert area <laughs> between the Mediterranean Sea and the... I mean, I, they could have been something special, but that potential is all gone. And so here in the beginning, Hosea is picking up that metaphor again. It must have been something he used commonly in his speech against Israel. But he doesn't have any of the charitable parts. He talks about them being a plant, but not a good one. And so in verse 1, he says, Israel is a lush vine. It yields fruit for itself. Now that sounds good, right? To be a lush vine yielding fruit for itself. Well, he goes on to say, the more his fruit increased, the more he increased the altars. Now, those are not altars that are good altars. And we know that because the poem goes on to say, the better his land produced, the better they made the sacred pillars. In the worship of Yahweh, there are no use of high grounds and sacred pillars. That is a pagan practice. So the kind of altars that he's describing here are pagan altars. As Israel grew, as it flourished, as they did better, well, they produced more um, pagan altars, and they, they bowed down to these, these pillars on hilltops. So in other words, the better off they were, the more blessed they were physically and socially and economically and politically by God, the worse they got. And their crops, the more crops they had, was just more false religion. Because, verse 2 says, their hearts are devious, and now they must bear their guilt. The Lord will break down their altars and demolish their sacred pillars. And so, instead of growing and praising the Lord more, they grew and praised themselves. They grew and praised Baal. They grew and praised Jeroboam. They grew and praised Assyria. They didn't praise the Lord, and so because their own hearts are so devious, so uh, ungrateful that God is just going to let them bear their guilt and he's going to tear down all those precious places to them. But still their hearts say, this is terrible, it's tragic, verse 3, we have no king, for we do not fear the Lord. What can a king do for us? Terrible, it's insane. We'll get to this in a little bit, but I think that but Hosea may have in mind here thinking of the book of Judges, where they have no king in Israel and everyone did was right in their own eyes. I say that because he refers specifically to a city that features prominently in the worst chapter in the Bible. We'll talk about that in a minute. But in their hearts, they say, we have no king. And so that also reminds us, too, of when they were jealous that other nations had kings and we have no king and the Lord is not our king we want. And they get Saul and uh, he's, you know, if you think that's bad, you see some of the things that David does and Solomon do, even though they're faithful to the Lord, the scriptures say, they also do some pretty terrible things and it just spirals out of control from there. And so they may say with their mouth, Mere words, as verse 4 says, but their hearts do not believe that God is their king. And so, because they don't, they don't fear the Lord, they not have no reverence or respect for him, it says they take false oaths and they make false covenants. In other words, they lie and deceive God and each other, which is why lawsuits break out like poisonous weeds in the furrows of a field. The United States of America is probably the most litigious country in the world. Where, I mean, you can, you stub your toe on the way out of a Chick fil A and you can sue the pants off of anybody for, I mean, that's the kind of, there's no real justice in that. We've just seen that we can use our law codes to get money and ex exploit people. And that's how Israel is in their day. They, they will make these false covenant and promises. And if you violate the fine print, they will, Take the shirt off your back. And so they have no honor. They have no dignity. Uh, they don't obey the Lord. They are cruel to each other in their law courts. And so this once sweet, 
delicious wild grape is a poisonous weed in the cracks of the field. That's how God has come to assess them. They were once so um, life-giving, and now they're, if you, if you took a bite of that weed, you'd probably choke and, and, and die of asphyxiation. <laughs> and so one of their main sources of poison, the Lord addresses, or Hosea addresses, <clears throat> is their golden calf idol in Bethel. Now, Bethel simply means Beth being the word for house and El being a name for God. Bethel, the house of God. That's where they put this calf idol. This is supposed to be a dignified city. But Hosea doesn't call it Bethel here. He calls it Beth Avon. Now, there's a little bit of wordplay going on here because Beth, again, that's house of, and Avon means wicked. <laughs> so the house of God, he's describing as the house of the wicked. And the reason why is because they have a gold and calf statue there. And it just shows you, verse 5, I think, shows you just how much they revere this false god. It says that the residents of Samaria, that's their capital city in northern Israel, have anxiety over this. Now, what, what does that mean, have anxiety over it? The idea that's being communicated here is that they have a reverence and a fear of that gold. There's a superstition behind it. They think if they don't make the right practices... Um, they don't sacrifice the right time of year. They don't do this. They're going to make that golden calf. They're going to make a statue, a lifeless statue, angry with them. He's going to hurt and harm them. <laughs> That's They have anxiety over that. Not over the God that controls the winds and the rain and the sun and the moon. And They don't have fear of him. They're scared of this statue. Even more than that, uh, the priest of God rejoice over it. In other words, they celebrate it. They they um, invoke it. They give it its quote unquote power by acting as if this this is God Himself. But the tragedy is that one day, all of them together, whether the priests or the lay people, they're going to mourn over this statue because Hosea says it's going to be pulled down and sent off. To Tiglath Pileser is the king that he's talking about here in Assyria as tribute. <laughs> so this God that they fear, who they think is just such a terrible, wrathful God, is going to be defenseless and pulled down and stripped of his gold and made into a different gold statue of a different false God under Tiglath Pileser's reign. And that's the God they're so fearful of. That's the God that they love and worship so much. He's going to go into a, a warehouse in a few years. Now, you would think that the destruction of this God, or, or the vulnerability, at least, the possibility that he could be destroyed, would get them questioning its power all along. You know, maybe this would help them to see, well, maybe this is the wrong God. Nope. Doesn't even cross their minds that they've backed the wrong God pony or calf in this situation. Even though in verse 6b, we read that Ephraim will experience shame because of how their idol is stripped down to its ugly rotten wood and that they've been fools to trust it, still they won't repent. Even after everything, even after they can remember. Do you remember when Hosea said years ago that uh, an oppressor would come and take our God and melt him down and do you remember that? Even when that happens, they will not repent. They won't trust the Lord, trust in the Lord. So uh, commentator Gary Smith says that this is God's um, great emasculation of their idols. That he is taking away any power, any dignity from it, shaming Israel. That's when uh, Ephraim is, will experience shame. It's that kind of shame when somebody is just so utterly defeated and humiliated and buried in the dirt. That they shouldn't, they should turn and look to something else, but they won't. And when their idols are gone, that is just a, that's just a herald that soon their wicked kings and all their disobedient citizens will disappear too. Hosea says, like foam on the surface of the water. <laughs> when you know the, the tide comes in and it looks so powerful and it's just that crest is about to hit and then it hits the, uh, it hits the beach. And it scatters and it foams up and then two seconds later it's receding. And you wondered why you were ever afraid of that, that wave splashing you. That is what Israel's going to be like.
like a vapor, like grass that and flowers that are here today and that are cut down and thrown to, to the oven tomorrow. And when the people are gone, the evil worship places, the sin of Israel, Hosea calls it, will be destroyed. And the curse of sin, the symbol of thorns and thistles, will envelop the ground. So not only are they going to be gone, their idols are going to be gone, um, everything's going to be uh, just utterly destroyed, and then the ultimate mark of their shame. Thorns and thistles will come back and take over the ground. Now something interesting that I didn't know and I learned in my study is that oftentimes these uh, Semitic people that worshipped Baal in this time period, when they depicted Baal, who is a storm god, a thunder god, a fertility god, he is often symbolized by an animal, a bull calf. I didn't know that. But Baal, an animal that's associated with him, like Odin has his raven, you know, and I think Zeus is an eagle sometimes. The idea of Baal is connected with a bull calf. Now, this, for the Israelites, I think is the, the thing that they confuse um, with the golden cow that they once called Yahweh back in Exodus. So when that idol is stripped bare of all its gold and its house is like an abandoned shopping center with weeds and trash and graffiti and everything else, and the people are left alone without it, when that day comes, they still won't repent. In fact, verse 8 is stunning. They'll just beg to die instead. We read this in Revelation 2 when people are facing the wrath of the Lord. They'll say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. So what they're saying, it's better in their estimation to die rather than repent and return to the Lord. It's better for them to just be wiped out in exile than to trust the Lord and, and to take his discipline and be restored one day. That's the kind of insane obstinance we're seeing. That's how far sin will take you. Till you're so mad, and I, by that I mean insane, you're so delusional, so deranged that you would rather be destroyed than to repent and be saved. And that's the kind of spirit I, of, I'd rather die than say I'm sorry that I feel like I see more and more in our evangelical circles today. Some Christians would rather do anything in the world I've seen this from people I know, too. They would rather do anything than repent, to admit that they were wrong about something, to, to, to maybe back down off of a, a political or cultural or spiritual idea that they had. So many people, I feel, in our churches today, would rather die alone and ashamed than just admit that, they, that a false god got the better of them for a moment. When our churches are dividing and splitting, and they are, over who to vote for, what we think about current events, how we navigate this novel global disease we've been dealing with for two years, what kind of music or clothing or culture we have in our worship services, what we're saying is when we divide over that stuff and cannot be united or reconciled is that we would, like these Israelites, rather be crushed by a Christless culture than simply come together in love and forgiveness and in the unity of the Spirit and the worship of the one true God. We're no different from Israel if we can't get along with any Christians. You know, I have a, a pastor friend that told me recently that he's had uh, some visitors at his church that have gone to all these churches in the area and they want to sit down and talk to him about what's wrong with every single one of them. <laughs> and he listens. And he's, he's bolder than I am. He says, you know what's the common denominator in all those stories? He'll say, you're the person that's the common denominator in all those stories. Maybe the problem isn't God's people. Maybe it's you. Maybe you don't really love God's people like you say you do. I wish I had that kind of boldness. But I think he's right when we find Christians that are so hard to, uh, to please and, and, and people that are nasty and divisive. I think that's not of the spirit of God. That's a spirit of Baal more than it is of the Lord. 
So those are, that's what is going to happen to their religion. If they don't repent, God's going to pull all that stuff down, destroy it. They're going to go off into exile. And they're so deranged by their sin, they'd say, we'd rather die than repent. That's scary. That's, that's a serious accusation. But he continues on in verses 9 through 15. Now, Hosea is just not done with this rebuke, unfortunately. And in fact, I think he's about to get even more severe <laughs> when he mentions this notorious city of Gibeah. Now, uh, as to help us remember, Gibeah is in the land of Benjamin, and it features predominantly in, uh, in one of, I think, is probably the most horrific chapters in all the Bible, and that's Judges 19. Now, <laughs> um, you know, it's, I, it's funny. I remember a couple years ago, uh, I was watching through some Bible project videos, and I'm always curious how they'll take certain kind of awkward passages. <laughs> and when they when they did the book of Judges, and they got to Judges 19 and 20, they just blotted out that page in their video and just said, some really terrible stuff happens here. Because it is it's such a... The, what is happening in that part of Scripture is just so horrific that it... I mean, we can hardly... W- w- fathom that this is an holy writ, you know? And so we read in that passage, a book, again, by the way, whose main refrain is that there is no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes, led to such a wild west of sin. We read there about how a woman was, who was a concubine was, um, was beaten to death or was beaten this is terrible, folks. She was raped to death, and she was cut up into pieces and mailed all over the country. I mean, it is just, you read this and can hardly believe it's in the Bible. And the story doesn't end there. And all of this led to such a terrible civil war that it ended with hundreds of women, other women being captured and forced into marriage. So that's the context that Hosea is dealing with here. He says, Israel... You have sinned like in the days of Gibeah. One of the most notorious moments in their history, the most shameful, uh, ignominious chapters of their time together as a people. You're just like that right now, Israel. That is a crazy thing to say. And if it has any truth, they ought to be quaking in their boots. Because God cannot abide that kind of evil. And he doesn't. But that's how bad things truly are. And again, it does not matter a hill of beans how strong their military is, how full their coffers are, how busy their markets, how grand their architecture, how fearsome their kings. They take their moral stand in Gibeah. They might like to go up to those high places and Bethavon, the house of wickedness. They might like to be, you know, go up to the palaces of Samaria, but they take their moral stand in the swamps of Gibeah. And so the war that they're currently embroiled in now, the the Syro-Ephraimite war, is a direct result of how they have remained fundamentally unchanged in heart since those days. That's also a serious condemnation because that was hundreds of years ago. Here they are hundreds and hundreds of years later and they've never really gotten better from that moment. And God will now use the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians and eventually past the Old Testament, the Greeks and the Romans and others to discipline this evil, unrepentant people that he calls his. They are about to be put in bondage for what he calls in verse 10, their double iniquity. Now in verse 11, we see this is where the, the Lord speaks directly and the metaphor changes back. It goes back to the calf metaphor. Now Israel was not only like sweet grapes that have turned into a, a poisonous rotten weed, but they're also, this is the Lord speaks positively, he looked at them at one time like a well-trained threshing cow. That's who they were, but now they're just a, an ornery bull that worships an image of a cow. At one time, Israel did the work that God gave Israel to do. Israel was obedient to his covenant. And it was then that God commended them to sow righteousness, to do good work in the world. 
That is to say, um, not to live just for themselves, but to live and and uh, uh, under God's law and reap God's faithful love. So if they were righteous, if they were obedient, if they did what was right, God would um, reward them with unbelievable blessings. I think we're getting a little bit of Genesis, early Genesis imagery here. I think they're supposed to break up, turn up the untamed soil that God gave to Adam and Eve in Genesis 2 to make something of this creation. Go, multiply, fill the earth, bring it under your dominion for my glory. Now, if only they would have stayed on this path, if Israel would have just done what they said they wanted to do at Mount Sinai, and to be a people of justice and love and true worship, God says he would have rained blessings down on them like a, like a beautiful spring shower that just gives life to everything around it. His blessings would have just flooded them. That's what they could have had. But we already know what they've sowed. We saw this a few chapters ago. They have sowed a spirit of deceit by allying with other evil nations. And now they're going to reap the whirlwind of destruction. They could have sown righteousness and reaped God's faithful love, but that's not what they chose. So verse 13a tells us, Furthermore, you've plowed wickedness and reaped injustice. You've eaten the fruit of lies. I that's got to be a reference back to Genesis 3, to the garden. You've eaten the fruit of lies. You've been deceived. You haven't listened to me. You've bitten the fruit, and death is now in your midst. They've gone their own way like Adam and Eve before them. And now look where it's going to get them. In exile and death, just like Adam and Eve. It's happening all over again. Why? Well, verse 13b says, because you have trusted in your own way and in your large number of soldiers. <laughs> you've trusted in your what's right to you and you've trusted in might makes right. But God's about to show them what might does make right, and it is not in their military. Look at the outcome here. Verse 14. The roar of battle will rise against your people, and all your fortifications will be demolished in a day of war, like Shalman's destruction of Beth Arbel. Now, this described event, this uh, destruction of Shalman's destruction of Beth Arbel, we don't have any other place in the Bible that this is mentioned, and we have no, as far as I know, the most recent <coughs> records we have from archaeology doesn't refer to this event. So we don't know exactly what's being described here. But scholars think it's very possible that Shalman was a, um, a reference to Shalmaneser, who was an Assyrian king who reigned about five years up from five years to about a year before their exile. So we're getting, so if that's true, if this is a part of Hosea's sermon that's been preached at a later time, this is talking about a battle that they just got out of. They just barely survived. Um, and it's just a, a maybe not even a year away from their exile. So we are really, it's minutes to midnight here, so to speak. And this disastrous battle was so cruel, so awful. Um, that it reminds them, it should remind them of their own cruelty at Gibeah centuries ago. Mothers are dashed to pieces along with their children. When, when we read in Judges 19, 20 about how those, you know, the women was tortured and, and butchered, and then other women were chased down and forced into marriage. That same thing that Israelites did against themselves now is that is being done against them. Just godless, inhuman, and straight-up demonic violence against people. And there's nothing of God in this. And finally, he says in conclusion, verse 15, so all that stuff, all that brutality, all of that stuff that we don't like to talk about in civilized company, so it will be done to you, Bethel, because of your extreme evil. At the dawn, the king of Israel will be totally destroyed. And the king is the king's destroyed, people are destroyed, they're idle, they're gone, they're done. Now, I think it's absolutely crazy, if we're honest, that um, 
that we look at all this suffering and barbarism and destruction and hell on earth. We look at all this, just the absolute disgusting consequences of sin, and we can see that it all starts with a wrong worship of God. (laughs) What seems so slight to us, you know, it's not a big deal. You know, let's, let's, I want to worship God the way I want to worship. Will lead us to unbelievably inhuman, immoral acts that we were just we couldn't think, we couldn't imagine that we'd be capable of. That is how serious idolatry is. It's not just it is not just this uh, affront to God's sensibilities. <laughs> it's not that we've just you know we're not in some Victorian house and we've used the salad fork instead of the you know the dinner fork and we've just you know we've just offended some order of ritual no it it's the first step on a downward spiral into hell itself and it's it is a bad it's not just a bad habit i should say these these things that seem private to us have public consequences and it's a it's it, this kind of way will lead us to uh not just stepping away from God to a degree, but a a whole way of living and being outside of God's justice and his grace. It's so bad, so cancerous, so fatal that it throws all of creation and society into chaos. Anytime idolatry comes up and it's tolerated for long enough and it's not changed, you get just, I mean, just a nothingness of a society afterwards. God designed the world, however, to work in perfect harmony, a harmony that can only exist through life in him. So the lesson for us, I think, in our own day and age on this side of the cross is that when we are tempted to offload our worship onto any politician or party or life philosophy or career or amusement or money or safety or family or comfort or pleasure or whatever, when we choose to make ultimate, the things are not ultimate, instead of God, this is how dehumanized we will become in the process. Eventually, given enough time, this is how feral we will become. Like a werewolf. (laughs) That seems like it's strong, but it's true. We turn into monsters left to our own devices, not worshiping God. We will destroy ourselves and each other because we are so blinded by our sin that we can't even begin to see how bad it is. That's why it's shocking in the Gospels when Jesus is talking about the judgment that will one day come, that if God did not cut short the days, even the elect, even God's children would be deceived. I think we are seeing that in fresh new ways in this world. How deceived some of us have become. We can't see our idolatry, and so therefore we can't see our injustice. That means treating other people wrongly. We can't see our apathy, and we can't see how it cuts at the very, goes against the very core of reality, which is God Himself, from whom we live and move and have our being. Nothing exists outside of Him. So I don't know about you. But I am exhausted by all this sin and judgment we've seen in the book of Hosea, especially when I realize that these realities of idolatry and injustice are in myself. How I can so easily rely on things that aren't God. How I can start to treat others a way that isn't right because I love myself more than I ought to, and I love them less than I ought to. We think these are just small things. But again, given enough time, sin will take you down a path you don't want to go. Or what starts as simple becomes insidious in ways that would terrify us. And it terrifies us, I think, to see how that we all are, how our society is, and how God's just response is to crush this. It makes me see how futile it is to try to improve on my own. So thanks be to God that when we're at this low point of despair, this is not the end of the story. Because we have Hosea 11 coming. Hosea 14 coming. And in Hosea 11, it's a passage that reminds us that when we are truly beyond redemption, God says to us, how could I ever give you up though? 
Incredible. It's my favorite passage in the Old Testament. It's not because we deserve it. Because we don't. It's because His grace is truly greater than all of our sin. And we see that in the coming of Jesus into our world, into our own lives to resurrect us from death and to eternal glory. And so it's to him that we look in repentance. If we take his word seriously, that's where we start. And it's to him we look in trust. And it's to him we look and assure hope that he can and will and does love to save people who cannot save themselves. And that's a very good news for us. Let's pray. Father, help us as we read these ancient words that can be so discouraging and disheartening that are not just about Israel and how they once were, but how we are as sinners. Help us to not refuse to repent and to really experience the joy and relief of forgiveness that we have only in you. We know you grant this to us and your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God, our Savior, and our King. And it's in him alone and his name we ask and pray for all these things. Amen.